Hi, I'm Jeff Sickinga, Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center, and this is The American Idea, where we discuss the ideas, people, and events that have made America what it is today. We believe that by understanding our history and our principles, we can better live up to the promise of the American founding and preserve our ongoing experiment in self-government. Welcome to The American Idea. I want to welcome everyone to this episode of The American Idea. Today, we're going to be talking about a topic that is absolutely vital to the health of the American Republic and has been understood to be that ever since our founding. But it's not a topic, actually, that gets that much conversation. Um, maybe it's almost like it's become a given in American life, but it is absolutely was given for our founders and is not a given in many, many places around the world. And that is the proper relationship between civilian and military leaders and the place of the military in American public and political life. For that conversation, I'm joined today by uh, who has now become, I think, an old friend, <laughs> not just of myself, but of Ashbrook, uh, Professor Miles Smith. Miles is a professor at Hillsdale College, um, a wonderful institution that many of our listeners, of course, know of and know well. Uh, he is a terrific teacher, uh, very engaging, uh, and also a, a perfect author. And in fact, I was just talking to Miles, he's got a couple of book projects he's working on right now, one on religion in the early republic, and then another one, very interesting to me, Bishops of the Episcopal Church in the 19th Century working out there with a colleague of Hills at Hillsdale College. Uh, so we've got a real expert on American history and including American, uh, the history of civilian military relations in America. Professor Miles Smith, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today on The American Idea. Thank you for having me, Jeff. I appreciate it. When I think of civilian military relations, I think of George Washington. I think of as the embodiment of that, and in many ways, charting a, I'll call it a unique American course, although maybe that's not true. I'm interested to hear what you have to say about that, but help us understand the importance of George Washington in our founding for sort of establishing the idea of the proper relationship between civilian and the military authority. I, th I think that Washington is so important because at the beginning of the what we call the Federalist era and, and amongst historians, the 1780s, as the Constitution is being signed, everybody is pretty sure by that point that the United States is going to be a republic. But one of the great fears uh, about republics is that they are sort of given to military dictatorships. And the great example for so many people is Caesar uh, from the classical world. And so... Uh, the, the, the status of the military in a republic was always something that was, was um, almost fearful for people. Will the officers sort of create an aristocracy and end up sort of taking over the government of the republic? So that was always a real fear, just in the abstract. At the end of the American Revolution, uh, you have this difficult circumstance where Congress has not been great with finances. And so the U.S. Army, the Continental Army, hadn't been paid for a while. And so you have a lot of grumbling amongst the officer corps, especially. And so they begin to talk amongst themselves about, look, we need to put the screws to Congress. We need to march on Philadelphia even perhaps and get the pay that's due to us. And so it's easy for us to sort of say, well, that that sounds bad. That sounds like a military coup. Uh, well, it wasn't that easy at the end of the American Revolution because the army had really been the most functional part of the government. They'd been doing the fighting. They'd been saving the skin, if you will of the civilian government. So there was a lot of reason to think these guys had a, a pretty significant grievance against Congress. And so what Washington is so important about is there's this moment where there's a meeting called in Newburgh, New York, uh, up the Hudson River from New York City, 70 miles or so, and that there was going to be a, essentially a, a conversation about what do we do. Um, and George Washington gets there and very subtly but very firmly puts down what was probably developing into a coup. So Washington basically makes it clear that we did not fight this revolution to end up having military government. We need to sit tight. Uh, we need to sort of tolerate civilian government 
even when it's bad. I think that's the that's the really remarkable principle here. Washington is so committed to civilian government that the army is sort of being told by him to sit tight even when they're messing up. Um, and that's sort of a hard conversation for us to have because we like to think, well, wouldn't we want the most efficient government that we could get? Wouldn't we want the firmest, most powerful, most uh, sort of decisive government we can get? And Washington wants all those things, but he never wants it as a military government. The principle for him is that significant. Um, and, and, and I was just going to say, isn't it true? If you look on the, I'm thinking of the inside of the Capitol Rotunda in Washington, D.C., and one of the scenes portrayed there is uh, has to do with civilian military relations. Yep. Uh, I mean, uh, there's all sorts. Is that um, which which scene is it? I that's the seen. scene. I'm thinking of the scene uh, when Washington hands back his. Oh, that's uh, right. He sword hands back to his sword, Yeah, uh, to Congress. Um, and this is where you have King George basically say, "Well, if he does that, he's the greatest man. He's 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 been the greatest man ever." because it was so rare for a general to hand back power. And in so so this is where the idea of Cincinnatus comes in, Washington as the American Cincinnatus, the Roman general general who wins the war, gives power back to the Republic. Um, and so that's all in the ether of, of the early national United States. Um, but I think we've probably taken for granted uh, how difficult that's been to maintain. It's something that's taken work. It's not something that just kind of happens every successive generation has had to actually work at it as well. In our own time, uh, you can see it working out in real time, the degree to which we trust the military with power. Um, in the early Republic, Andrew Jackson, who was a military general, uh, is very careful to make sure his inauguration is stripped of military imagery altogether because he knew this was going to be something that people would accuse him of, of being a general who was coming to power, Zachary Taylor, a similar thing in the uh, inauguration there in the beginning of 1849. And so uh, American generals, for the most part, have actually been very careful about this. If you'll notice pictures of Dwight Eisenhower uh, in the 1950s, even before he's president, he's never in uniform. Um, he's always very careful to never appear uh, in military clothing as president. Um, and so this is something that every generation of Americans, uh, and especially American statesmen, has to sort of recommit to. Tell us some of the fund some of the fundamental problems, questions, challenges that confronted uh, civilian military relations in the founding or the early Republic. You mentioned an example of Washington, but were there other challenges or problems that we faced? Absolutely. One of the things, there's a, a wonderful book on the early Republic um, uh, Army. I'd recommend it to anybody who's interested by a professor at West Point named Sam Watson. It's two volumes. Um, it's really a, a magnificent book. And one of the things you learn as you read about the U.S. Army and the early Republic is it was far and away perhaps the most professional institution uh, that was a part of the, the federal government. It was It was excellent for the most part. It's small. They're underpaid, but it's also very good. I think this is maybe one of the things people don't realize. It gets uh, the U.S. military gets a bad rap, say, in the War of 1812, but the actual U.S. Army acquits itself pretty well when it's joined with militia. It's not not so easy. So for a lot of people in the early Republic, the one institution that they knew they could trust reflexively was the actual regular army. It was uh, Thomas Jefferson didn't like a standing army, but by the by the election of 1800 and really by by 1820 people trust the army and so there's this sort of reflex to end up trusting generals and there's actually quite a few generals in american political life earlier on so it, it, there's sort of a tension there's sort of a almost a fear of are we being hypocritical we've said all this stuff about not wanting military men running our government and yet here we here we are um and so I think that that was the biggest tension is what do we do with the fact that everybody seems to like generals and doesn't seem to mind them in politics, but how do we square that with our commitments to Republican government and especially to civilian Republican government? Yeah. So did you have uh, in, in the early Republic um, critics of the United States military or people who continuously warned, look, we shouldn't elect you know, generals as presidents. We have to 
uh, keep the army essentially small or, you know, essentially defund the Navy or the army because it's not appropriate to have a professional military in a republic. Did those critics persist past, you know, what we think of as the anti-federalists? Yeah, they did. I mean, one of the interesting critics is Thomas Jefferson, who was pretty critical of a standing army uh, through, throughout his, 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 his political career. And of course, when he becomes president, what does he do is he signs into law the creation of West Point, right, <laughs> which was very unpopular among some more radical Jeffersonians. He uses the army for the explorations. People forget that the Lewis and Clark exploration is the core of discovery. It has a military element to it. Jefferson uh, strengthens the Navy, enlarges the Navy. So I think you have a lot of people who are critics who turn around and are perfectly comfortable with using a, using the army for what we might even think of as political purposes, certainly for purposes that aren't strictly military. And so they do persist, but uh, there's always been a little bit of a, an edge of hypocrisy about how even Americans who are very against uh, a standing army <clears throat> have no problem turning around and feeling like it should be enlarged if it will suit their purposes. One of the moments, uh, to my mind, I always think of in, in American civilian military relations, really important moment is the Civil War, and in particular, Abraham Lincoln, because, of course, he's the commander in chief leading the war. He himself uh, has a very limited, let's say, military experience and certainly by no means an officer in the regular army of any kind. Um, what are civilian military relations like with Lincoln? Because our listeners will know, for example, that he famously... Um, looked for a fighting general, at least in the East, and had a hard time finding them, and some tense exchanges between Lincoln and some Union generals. Yeah, what's interesting is Lincoln is is probably a, uh, a bit hands-off with his generals. I think we have this idea of him being sort of a um, sort of a, a, an almost sort of um, genius when it came to, to military uh, operations. That was true in one sense. He was a good personnel manager, uh, much more so than his Confederate analog, Jefferson Davis. Um, but Lincoln's interesting because he really, um, he just wants generals who fight. Um, and he has this almost utilitarian view of the military, uh, which is is good because he's not so taken with, I think mil Lincoln's not necessarily someone who just fawns over the army. Um, certainly not to the extent for the, the in the same way to say the Confederate high command regularly fawns over the Confederate army, even as they're angrier at it. And you just don't have that element with Lincoln. Um, <clears throat> James McPherson has a good short book on Lincoln as commander in chief, which is worth uh, which which is worth reading. And what what you find is Lincoln is uh, fairly relaxed. He wants to keep the military. Uh, certainly within what he thinks is constitutional bounds, Lincoln has no no problem using executive civilian power to push the army around when he needs to. But he doesn't do that to a large extent. So in, in one sense, Lincoln probably does this the best of any president, even more so uh, than, than FDR, who was accused of meddling um, in ways I don't think that we, we're familiar with. We, we tell ourselves the triumphant story of World War II, which is, which is not inaccurate. But FDR was seen as sometimes uh, playing a bit too much politics with generals. James K. Polk was accused of this very much playing politics with generals. So of the big conflicts of the presence oversee large conflicts, uh, Lincoln's probably the, the, the most relaxed, um, certainly the most well-received out of Franklin Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, uh, Lyndon Johnson. <clears throat> you could probably say even George W. Bush. In some ways, Lincoln is certainly the most hands off in the day they running of the army, uh, but also the most willing to sort of put it in its place um, in, in a lot of ways. So I think this is why he's seen as sort of this uh, sort of magnificent, almost military genius. I don't think he would have ever claimed that he was certainly a genius when it came to understanding the relationship between the army and civilian government. What about Lincoln's generals themselves, Grant, Sherman, um, folks like that? Did they, uh, was that idea that the president as a civilian is in charge of us and including perhaps, you know, Lincoln's his hands off and not setting strategy or meddling in any tactics, that kind of thing, but just sort of the general course of the war and what to do and not to do. 
Uh, did did they imbibe that ethos and they accepted that and they submitted to the president or in their exchanges, is there pushback? What's that relationship like? Well, at, Lincoln makes a really good decision in 1862 when he's allowed um, uh, his, his then sort of the, the supreme commander of the, the Union Army, George McClellan. He gives him a very long leash. Um, Lincoln is very patient with McClellan to the point McClellan has this massive army. M McClellan was an organizational mastermind, by the way. And so the organizationally in the army he hands off to his successors is good. But tactically, he just won't do anything. And Lincoln gives him so much of a leash so that by the time that he finally says, all right, McClellan, you're done, uh, his, his generals have a pretty good idea. OK, this guy will let us sort of have a long leash, but we have to do something. Like we actually have to, to do something. And so one of the things Lincoln does <clears throat> is it makes it very clear the next generals he's going to appoint are not going to be prima donnas. And so especially after McClellan, you have Ambrose Burnsides, who's not a prima donna, but who isn't an action guy. Uh, Joseph Hooker is not a political prima donna. He's certainly got an ego. Um, and he's an action guy in the worst way possible. And so I think once you get those kind of, especially those three at the end, um, Meade, Sherman, and Grant, none of those guys are interested in making a name for themselves politically, at least off of their their army posts. Uh, they are all aware that Lincoln, by that point, has his sea legs under him. He's not afraid to replace commanders. He's had this bad experience with, with McClellan. He's not going to repeat that. So I think by by the time you get to 1863, 64, 65, Lincoln's established himself so well that his generals know kind of where they can push a little bit and where they can't. And so I think Lincoln's, his longevity, his, his creativity, his willingness to cycle through commanders uh, when he felt like it was a necessity allows him to sort of earn the trust of those three who in a lot of ways end up winning the war for him. <clears throat> How how I'm 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 curious myself and some of our listeners. Sometimes you'll hear the phrase, even during the Civil War, that there were political generals. I guess that you'd say people who um, owed their appointment to politics. How common or prevalent was that? It was very common. I think people forget that even today, uh, officers are appointed by the president. Technically, um, they are not simply by virtue of going through training. Made officers, you have to be appointed. By the president, and so political generals in the Civil War were very common. Uh, Nathaniel Banks, uh, who had been the, sec the uh, U.S. Speaker of the House, becomes a general uh, by virtue of he's popular, he's well liked, and people say, "Well, there's no, there hadn't been any good New England generals. Give us one." And so he's given command, sort of out in Louisiana and Texas, where he can't do too much damage. Um, but there were quite a few uh, generals, obviously. Uh, state, state as states raised regiments, there would be political appointees to colonelcies um, and generalships for state state regiments, and those are sometimes regularized, quite often regularized in the Union Army. So what happened quite a bit. What's interesting, of course, is uh, neither Sherman nor Grant nor Meade are political generals. Uh, if you actually look at their career trajectories, Sherman's the president of what's in LSU, which is not an important school. At always out in Baton Rouge, <clears throat> Grant is barely making it as a businessman, probably not making it, he would have said. Um, and Meade's a sort of just pencil pusher. Uh, he's considered this nerd. His dad had been a diplomat. And so none of those guys are political generals. And I think what's interesting is they really rise to the top precisely because they're not doing something that's relatively common, which is sort of making a name in politics off of getting a uniform or whatnot. It's one of the things about U.S. Grant is he he's not a big uniform guy. Uh, none of our successful it, it seems like pictures of him always show him a little slovenly. <laughs> a little slovenly. He, he took this from Zachary Taylor, by the way. Zachary Taylor did not like uh, riding in uniform. We have uh, one of the interesting things when he's commanding the armies in Mexico. He's on his horse. He sat with one leg over the other wearing a slouch hat, big, big straw hat, and would oftentimes just have draped his uniform over his horse. Uh, and so he was not uh, as really, yeah. particular about uniforms. So there's something about this that Americans are kind of inspired by, the sort of the, the rough and ready aspect, which was, <clears throat> of course, Zachary Taylor's name, old rough and ready. Uh, Post-Civil War, uh, 
if the if the idea of look the president really is commander in chief he's a civilian you really do have to um accept his leadership and work within that framework if you're the military post war and we go into a profound period of peace in many ways in the united states from the civil war at least to world war 1 of course with the spanish american war in there um do we see the continuation has has civilian military relations become regularized now in such a way that everybody sort of knows what the the situation is in in our republic that's a great question i'm getting ready to teach the gilded age um this year which i'm excited about uh, one of the things that i've i've been surprised to discover is the military kind of falls out of the day-to-day -day thought of americans after the civil war most americans don't see it they know it's out there fighting Indians, but there's just not the regular contact. What uh, you, There are some military figures who obviously become president. In fact, you have three generals in a row. You have Ulysses S. Grant, Rutherford Hayes, and then James K. Garfield. Um, and then like someone like uh, McKinley had served in the military, but he was, he was not, not a particularly um, high up in rank. So you have generals in politics, but that's only because pretty much every able-bodied man in the United States in the 1870s had probably served in either the Confederate or the Union armies. So they're not really presidents because they're generals. They're generals, and there's a lot of them who happen to have sort of found some sense of a political coalition or whatever, and that's why they've become president. But the, but the military itself sort of doesn't function as, um, as a significant political influencer in the Gilded Age in the same way it did in the American Civil War. <clears throat> Before we continue with our conversation, I'd like to have one of our faculty members tell you about a special documents-based graduate program for teachers of American history, government, and civics. I'm Dr. John Moser, professor of history at Ashland University and chair of the Master of Arts in American History and Government program. The MAG program is for teachers who want to master their craft by building content knowledge from original documents, from the words of those who lived and shaped our history, and not from textbooks or lectures. Our program is built around the discussion of original sources, and our faculty, both from both Ashland University and from across the country, is committed to this approach. We believe that the best way to get to know our past is to have a conversation with those who were there. James Madison, Frederick Douglass, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Theodore Roosevelt, and so many more. We offer two programs for working teachers and a broad selection of core and elective courses. You can learn more at tah.org slash programs. And what's fascinating to me is... Um that kind of uh, rise of a permanent professional army that's sort of somehow part of American public life and consciousness, um, it, am I wrong to think it, that doesn't even really start with World War I? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a creation of, of what we might call the post-war era from 1945 on. I mean, the United States Army shrinks back tremendously, even between World War I and World War II in 1940. Uh, the United States Army is, I think, 17th or 18th largest in the world, um, uh, snuggled right there in between Portugal and Romania. Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so you have, uh, of course, the military expands very dramatically, obviously, during World War II. And you have significant public figures like Eisenhower. At, because they're generals, they, they the sort of generals reclaim their place in the, the American public life spotlight um you have uh, in someone like eisenhower some people have said with respect to his general be general becoming president another washington mm. in his understanding of civilian military relations what do you make of ike i've 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 heard this the other washington and i i i um one of the things i think is I'd love to do a second part of the initial article I did for Law and Liberty on this, is the United States military in the post-war era is operating very differently politically than it did uh, before World War II even. It's an imperial military, right? It's it's maintaining, on some level, the liberal empire. Um, and so the United States Army is everywhere in the post-war era. Uh, 
it's in Germany, it's in South Korea. Yeah, it, my my dad himself served from nineteen uh, in the nineteen fifties in Europe. Yeah, and so uh, and it's and it's and it's just all over the place. And so the the military is is it defending the United States? Yes, I, I don't want to contest that it's um, not doing that, but right, it's defending something more than the United States too. It's defending liberal empire, and I think one of the interesting things is how we understand Eisenhower um, seems almost <clears throat> as if he's less of a Washington and more of one of these sort of the best of the Romans, right? He understands he's a general who's become Caesar and he's defending the Roman empire. I think of, of Eisenhower as more of an Aurelian figure than a Washingtonian figure. Uh, George Washington's really uncomfortable with mass militarization. He's this remarkable man who he 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 thinks of the military as this tool, but he is so uncomfortable with 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 it. I think this is what makes him incredible, right? Like he's this perhaps one of the greatest generals the country ever had as as a, at least as a strategic thinker. I don't think he even thought he was a tactical genius. Um, but he's very humble about his own military exploits. And he's very sort of reserved about the military itself um, in a way that Dwight Eisenhower was not. Dwight Eisenhower is worried about uh, the military becoming sort of the main economic engine of the country. Um, and he's very clear about that. And I think he was pressing about that in ways that uh, people weren't. A lot of people have said, well, he has the statement about the military industrial complex. That's true. He never is proposing there, though, to sort of emasculate the U.S. military. He wants to be powerful, but I think he wants it to remain relatively independent from, from the political sphere. And so I think that's that's been misread. A lot of, there's a sort of an anti-war tradition that basically, which I think is, is worth at least listening to, that says Eisenhower doesn't really want um, a powerful military. He wants the Amer United States to sort of almost withdraw from its imperial commitments. I don't think that's what's going on. Eisenhower seems pretty committed to keeping U.S. military in Europe to keep the Soviet Union at bay. He just doesn't want it to sort of drive American internal politics to the same degree it might through economics and, and through partisan politics, too. I see. OK, <clears throat> well, then I, I'm thinking of um, even in that post-war era, uh, you know, I'm thinking of someone, and of course, I'm just sort of a little bit slightly earlier, but one moment of potential military civilian trouble uh, is the, in the person of General Douglas MacArthur. Hmm. That's an interesting moment in American history that to me seems quite telling. Yeah, and and Jeff, you you probably remember that one of the great standard biographies of Douglas MacArthur was written by William Manchester, and the title of it was, of course, American Caesar. Um, and so Manchester is really proposing that, yeah, that, that, that MacArthur views himself as a sort of Caesar, right? He is a general who probably should be running the country and he doesn't really trust civilians uh, to run the United States. Uh, he trusts generals implicitly. He trusts the most professional generals there are. He loves West Point, his alma mater. Um, he is a, perhaps as Caesarist a figure as the United States has had, at least in the 20th century. Um, and yet he was also incredibly popular. I think we people forget that when he's relieved by Harry Truman, the pollsters, it comes out, people are in are on MacArthur's side, uh, which is another kind of scary tension, right? Like, well, we, we like civilian control of our military, but we don't really like when presidents sort of push it around too much. So uh, yeah, MacArthur's this fascinating figure. There's a new biography of him I haven't read by Arthur Herman, um, that I, I would be fascinated to know um, what uh, Mr. Herman says. But I, I, I think of, of, I mean, I tend to think that MacArthur's impressive. My former hometown of Norfolk, Virginia is his hometown. So I, I spent a lot of time with the MacArthur legacy. Um, but I, I do think he's a Caesar's figure. And I think he's someone that we should be very wary about, even as I think he's one of the most impressive Americans of the 20th century. If we go back to that moment of controversy, um, as many of our listeners will know that episode in American history, but a number of them won't. Um, when you said this is he might be the most Caesarist, what is it particularly that MacArthur says or does or threatens 
that precipitates a crisis. He, he, uh, ignoring the president, uh, right? This really this idea that, yeah, you're president, but I'm the commander in chief of these armies. And what, what MacArthur sees is almost a sort of duality in how the military should be run. The president can kind of talk to the military, um, but the military is going to have an equal and opposite conver- uh, voice in that conversation. And Harry Truman's position, and I think the one that's Washington's as well, is no, that's not true. This is not an equal convers- a conversation among equals. The military has to listen to civilian leadership, whether it likes it or not. Um, and I don't know how committed to that principle Douglas MacArthur was. Um, I, I think he would have, I think he would have said that. Um, but his actions tell a really interesting story. I think I think it's it's a fascinating episode. Uh, Bill Brands, H. W. Brands, has a book on it that I've not read, but I have it on my shelf. Um, and so I I think it's probably an episode that needs to be rethought, especially given the fact that that generals are in our politics much more than they have been um, in the last 15 years. Generals have showed up in politics much more so, certainly than when I was a kid in the 90s um, and perhaps even even the 1980s. You have General Haig as Secretary of State, and then there's kind of a lull um, where you don't have generals in politics to the same degree, really until the, the end of the Obama, beginning of the Trump presidency. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Post 9-11, does does 9-11, and I think what lots of people have remarked as um, per, perhaps legitimate, but certainly the growth of kind of the national security apparatus, even in the White House itself because of the, of, of the war on terrorism, um, post 9-11, does the military-civilian relationship change or get modified in any way? It does change. There's a, a really fascinating book, and I cannot call, recall the title of it. Um, but one of the one of the theses was that the very beginning of the the quote unquote war on terror. This would have been the fall of 2001, the spring of 2002, and assuming the fall winter of 2001 2002, you have the proposition that um, essentially there is now a war on terror. And this what this did was it militarized the conflict immediately that this is now a military thing. Whereas there was at least some thought is why aren't we treating this as something that should be dealt with by the FBI and domestic law enforcement? Why is this immediately becoming something that the United States military is dealing with? And obviously there was the impulse, well, we got to go get bin Laden. Um, And what's interesting is, of course, we didn't get bin Laden until, what, about a decade later? Um, And under President Obama, um, and what we did was we flipped the, the the regime in in Afghanistan, which of course has now been turned back. Of course, the Taliban's in control again after two decades. Um, and so there was an impulse amongst some policymakers to make this a military thing. That the military needed to be the one that was spearheading this. And I think what you saw is the military became a much more ubiquitous presence in American life. Uh, at professional sporting events. Yeah, I was thinking of I was thinking of the flyovers of military yeah, planes, yeah. which were unheard of before, and now are that's, kind of common. That's that's right. I, I was born in, in in the very end of nineteen. I'm born in Christmas of nineteen eighty three. I'm old enough to remember major sporting events where you, maybe uh, you would sing the national anthem, but that would be it. And now what you see is it's interesting. You have soldiers being flown into uh, games of some sort and reunite with their families on the field. And uh, people, the uh, sporting teams will give stuff to soldiers. And so what's what's really interesting is that um, there seems to be almost a tension between, we, we, we know these people serve us, but there's also more of a distance, right? There's almost more like, uh, they're almost more alien to us, which is why we have, feel like we have to do stuff for them publicly. Um, my grandparents' generation, everybody had been in the military so you didn't feel like you needed to do something for them it was just a part of 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 american civic existence so for sure some things has changed and there's a lot of scholarship on this and some of it's very heated i think of a figure like andrew basovich whose scholarship i respect um uh has very very difficult things to say about this he's he's somewhat censorious of american civilian uh life um and so it's Certainly a conversation that I think needs to be had because uh, 
uh, I'm probably more uncomfortable with the amount of with the regularity with which I see the military precisely because I'm a child of the 90s and you never saw it in the 90s. Um, it was a world was a pretty peaceful place and maybe that's not the military's fault I don't want to blame that but it's certainly different um, and certainly something that's worth asking about the Trump presidency the amount of generals who were employed by the Trump presidency and that's not a partisan thing President Biden has retained quite a few generals uh, General General Austin um, uh, Lloyd Austin also a general uh, as Secretary of Defense, James Mattis was. What's interesting is both of President Trump's uh, secretaries of defense, neither were generals, um, Robert Gates and uh, Donald Rumsfeld. Um, I'm thinking about uh, President Clinton's secretaries of defenses uh, were not that I remember being generals. William Cohen uh, was not. Um, and uh, President Bush's was, of course, uh, not a general, it was uh, Dick Cheney. Um, and so I can't remember the last general who had served as Secretary of Defense or Secretary of, the, of War before this very recent era. You may be able to remember Jeff more than no, I No, you're right. I mean, if you go back to Bush with Don Rumsfeld and then you go forward, it's there's civilians in there. And then uh, and that to me, that raises the question though, looking forward, um, post 9-11 and some of the immediacy and urgency of the war on terror, past um what do you see as the future of military civilian relationships in the next decades for america um i think that's a good question i, I not being a, a a member of of the united states military i i, I don't want to i don't want to project too much and prophesy too much i think what i would propose is we probably need to ask um important questions about the relationship between society and the military, which I think would help answer some of the questions about our government and the military. Um, it, it, we are a lo relatively low trust society compared to our predecessors. One of the last institutions that's reflectively trusted, um, at least by pollsters, is the US, US military. Um, so uh, we may, might need to ask ourselves why. Um, and sort of also ask, is our tendency to trust the military, does it mean we ask it to do things that it shouldn't um, in our own day? Are we fobbing off uh, things to the military that shouldn't? I think one of the things I recall is after Hurricane Katrina, there was a real sense that only the Louisiana National Guard was capable of actually uh, doing the work of the government. Um, and so the military has been much more reflexively used, for example, in natural disasters and something. So I think I think there's this reflex to if something needs to be done and it needs to be done seriously, it has to be done by the armed the uniformed armed services of the United States. And that's very new. Um, that is not something that was the case for the vast majority of the 20th century. Yeah, that's a, fa a fascinating insight. Um, you mentioned your article in Law and Liberty for our listeners, if they want to read it. Yeah, I, I um, it's it's in uh, Law and Liberty. It was uh, called the Lessons of Newberg, um, the Lesson of Newberg. Excuse me. And basically, I, I sort of recounted the history that you and I've um, talked about. I, th I think probably perhaps what I want to emphasize is I think we should appreciate the military and its role in maintaining constitutional liberties in the United States when necessary, especially against foreign injuries, we, we re really need to remind ourselves that you don't need the military in politics. I think this is one of the things that's perhaps changed. I remember when uh, when James Mass was made secretary, that there was really a sense, oh, finally, we've got somebody in there who knows how to get the job done. We got a Marine general. Um, and that reflex is worrisome to me um, because that was not the case. When I was a kid, no one said, oh, finally, you know, we got a range. I think Americans have thought that for a long time, for sure. But now we're acting on it. So we lack that Washingtonian discipline. Whereas, yeah, maybe we think the job would be better done by a general. But Washington would say, still, the principle of civilian rule is just too important. I'm not sure we're there anymore. We're probably well, 
if that's true, that's an important reminder for all of us uh, who want to sustain a healthy republic, right? And one of the great hallmarks of the health of the American Republic has always been a very good relationship, uh, by and large, overall, between American military and civilian leaders, and so distinctive in the American experience compared to so many other countries that have been thrust into turmoil because of an improper relationship. So, Miles Smith, thank you so much for taking the time to join us to remind us of the importance of that relationship in the course of American history. Thanks thank for joining you. us today on The American Idea. Thank you for listening to this episode of The American Idea. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to subscribe at Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and leave a five-star review. If you want to learn more or get involved in Ashbrook's vital work, visit our website, ashbrook.org.